Genesis chapter 3, the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is at the beginning there when the Bible reads in verse number 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now this story here, very early on in the Bible, is of course the fall of mankind, when the first man, Adam, Sin, the Bible says, wherefore, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Satan started out by tempting Adam's wife, getting Adam's wife to commit sin, and then she convinced her husband to sin, and thereby doomed and damned the human race. But thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ coming and paying for our sins and providing a way for us to be saved. But the part that I want to focus on here is, first of all, what he says in verse number 5, he says, In the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the first thing that the devil uses to try to tempt man into sin is to try to appeal to this thing of, you can be like God, or you can become gods. God is trying to hold something back from you, and also he, he uh, appealed to the, the curiosity by saying, you'll know good and evil, you'll know something that you don't know right now. Look at verse number 6. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 16, 19, the Bible reads, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. He said, look, I'm glad to hear of your obedience to God's word. He said, I'm glad that you're obeying Christ and living for the Lord. But he said, I want you to be wise unto that which is good. But I want you to be simple concerning evil evil. He said it's good if you live a good life and you're not exposed to all the evil. And we shouldn't want to know everything that's evil in this world. And a lot of times curiosity can lead people into sin. Young people will watch movies or look at pornography or get on the internet and surf certain sites just out of curiosity. Just to see what it's about. Maybe mom and dad have forbidden something and said, son, daughter, don't go there, don't do this. And they just have to know what it is. And they want to know all about it. Another thing is that many people will seek to try to study false religions in order to somehow defeat those religions. My cousin was in a Bible college. And he said that he had to read the entire Koran, cover to cover, the Koran, which is about, I believe, two-thirds the length of the New Testament. So it's not near as long as the Bible. But it's a pretty substantial book. And he had to read the entire Koran. And the sad thing is, there are probably many of the students in that same San Diego Christian College that haven't even read the Bible cover to cover one time. I'm not saying he's one of them. I'm saying there are students there, I guarantee you, who haven't read the Bible. See, we don't need to know everything that's evil in this world. We don't need to study everything that's wrong. You know, if, if you're going to spot counterfeit money, you basically just need to study the real thing. And if you can identify the real thing, you'll know when something's off. You'll know when something's false. And so we don't need to read the Quran. We don't need to read and study the Book of Mormon. We don't need to dig into all these things because God said, learn not the way of the heathen. And he also said to the children of Israel when they came to the promise, that, he said, inquire not how these people worship their gods. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, destroy their altars, break down their images, and he said, you don't need to inquire and know everything about what they teach. Now, you say, Pastor Anderson, you seem to know a lot about false religions. You know how I know about them just through soul winning. I mean, when you're out knocking doors on soul winning, and you preach the gospel to the Muslims, and you preach the gospel to the Mormons, you preach the gospel to the Catholics, you get a true story of what they believe. Because in the process of preaching the gospel to them, 
you're going to hear what they say, and you can get a feel and understand everything about these churches without having to bring the satanic book itself into your home and read over it page by page. Just from talking to the thousands of Mormons and thousands of Muslims and thousands of Catholics I, I've talked to, I already know what their religion's about because they'll all tell you the same thing, that salvation is by works. You know, that it's repent of your sins to be saved. That it's turn over a new leaf. That it's, you know, you can lose your salvation. They'll all tell you the same thing. So I don't need to learn about what's evil. And God here is showing us how the devil used that to tempt Eve, her curiosity to know evil, to understand the things that are wrong. And he said, you'll be as gods. Now, turn to Isaiah 14, because this is a common theme with Satan throughout the Bible. All through the Bible, starting with Genesis 3, we see Satan offering man the ability to be God saying, if you eat of this fruit, you will be as gods. You will know good and evil. But in Isaiah 14, we see actually where Satan's downfall was. And it was in the exact same thing. Look at Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, who's Lucifer? He's talking about Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hear me now. He did not say that he wanted to replace God. That's what you'll commonly hear preached. He wanted to replace God. Is that what it says in the passage? No. He said, I will also sit in the sides of earth. You see how many times also is used? He said in verse 13, I will exalt my throne above the sides of the north. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the north. I will be like the most high. He didn't say, I'm going to replace the Most High. But he said, I'll be a God too. I'll be like Him. I will also be in the position that He is now in. But what's the result? Verse 15. God is telling Lucifer, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. <laughs> Go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. So we saw in Genesis 3 that Satan is trying to tell man that he can be as God. And then in Isaiah 14, he's being uh, uh, cast out of heaven, foresaying in his heart that he would be as God, that he would be like God, that he would be in addition to God, that he would also be there with God. Not that he would replace God, that he, but he would be like God, like the Most High. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. This is a man. It's a human being they speak of. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God. Though thou said thine heart is the heart of God, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches. And thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down, where? To the pit. What's that referring to? Hell. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that saith thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hands of strangers. For I have spoken it, 
saith the Lord God. Now here's what's interesting. He continues talking. He starts out, he's talking to the prince of Tyre. The word prince in the Bible is often used to refer to a great leader, great ruler, great king. Prince comes from the uh, Latin word, you know, you just, well, you know Spanish. A lot of people here know Spanish. Principio. What's it mean? And el principio, creo, you know. It basically is the beginning. You know, we go have the principal at the school basically because he's the head guy. That's why he's called the principal. He's the number one guy. And so the word prince is basically referring to somebody who's at the top. You know, somebody who's a ruler. Somebody who's a leader. The reason that we think of a prince as being the firstborn son of a king is because of the fact that he's the firstborn son, and prince comes from the word meaning first. That's where that English word comes from. But in, chapter, in verse 12, he says, Son of a man, son of a man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, I thought that that's who we were already talking about. But see, you see, what he does here is he starts talking about Satan and referring to him as the king of Tyrus. So he changes gears. From the first part of the passage, we saw a man on the throne, a human being, who basically thought that he was God, didn't he? He was lifted up, and he said, I'm a God. I'm like God. And he's being preached against here by Ezekiel, speaking God's word to him. But then he starts to talk about Satan, because that's really where that mentality comes from, of wanting to be in the place of God, or like unto God, or in addition to God. Look what it says in verse 12. And you say, well, how do you know he's talking about Satan? Well, you'll see in a minute. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now you see that? The, the, the literal prince of Tyrus at that time was not in the garden of God in Eden. But he had something in common. He wanted to be a God is what he said in his heart. It says in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub. So are we talking about a human being here? No, we're talking about a cherub. A cherub is one of these heavenly creatures, these angelic beings like uh, Satan, who is, you know, an angel, okay, a cherub. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So he started out as a good creature, Lucifer. Until iniquity was found in him. Until he basically set out to deceive man, to be man's God in, a, in, a, in opposition with the true God. He said in verse number 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be anymore. Now there's so much in this passage. There's so many things about Satan. We notice that he's a musical creature. It talks about his pipes and his tablets being created in him. We know that he's a very beautiful creature. The Bible says he's the most beautiful, the perfection of beauty. That's why he was lifted up in his heart and said, I will be like God. I'll be like the Most High. That Why was the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, why was he lifted up? Because of his great riches and because of the merchandise that he had made because of his great wisdom. So, the prince of Tyre was a man of wisdom and a man of riches. Therefore, he was puffed up and said, I am a god. Satan was puffed up because of his great beauty, because of his uh, musical ability. Notice it talks about his sanctuaries. You know, Satan has his sanctuaries, doesn't he? Satan has his music, doesn't he? These are some of the tools that he uses, sanctuary in his holy place. These are some of the tools that he uses 
today to deceive man. But that's not what I'm preaching about tonight. Turn to Acts chapter 12. We're going to read one more place and then I'll get into the purpose of the sermon. And I'm not going to preach long tonight because my throat is in pain. I don't know what's wrong. I've got Chris Segura disease. <laughs> Keep up. How long did you lose your, your voice for? It's still gone. It's still gone. <laughs> last time. So I'm, I'm joining the Segura Club. We're taking a vow of silence here starting tomorrow until our throats heal. But in Acts chapter 12, verse 20, now you remember who was that king in, in Exodus 28? Or I'm sorry, Ezekiel 28? He was the king of what? Tyrus. Tyrus. Okay, well, look at this. This is interesting. In Acts 12, 20, it says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre. Okay, so it's the same city, the same area. This is a Gentile city that's basically just north of Israel on the sea coast. But they came with one accord to him. He's coming to Tyre and Tyre. They came with one accord to him, King Herod. And having made blessed as the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So we see here that King Herod gives a great speech. He's all, you know, set up in his royal apparel, and he makes this rousing political speech, and the people of Tyre look at him and say, it is the voice of a god and not a man. Now what should he have said at that point? He should have said, no, I'm not a god, I am a man. There's only one God. And he should have given God the glory. He shouldn't have said, well, I'm a God too. I mean, he didn't really deny God here. He's just, basically, he's, a, he's being told by these people, you're a God also. He said, he didn't say, you're God. They said, it's the voice of, what? A God. He didn't give God the praise. He didn't give God the glory. He took that adulation. He accepted it upon himself. And therefore, the angel of the Lord smote him. I don't know if he died right then and there, but at that moment he was smitten with worms, and those worms ate up his flesh. I, did it happen right there on the platform? Probably. I don't know. <coughs> Maybe it happened later that day, but the, but the worms began to uh, eat him up from the inside at that moment. Go to Galatians 1. The title of my sermon tonight is this, Latter Day Satan. That's the title of my sermon tonight. Latter-day Satan. Because today we have a religion that calls itself the Latter-day Saints, but in reality, it's not Latter-day Saints. Because according to the Bible, a saint is somebody who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Bible says that by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The saints are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The saints are those who have no confidence in the flesh, as Paul said, but have their faith in Jesus Christ as their righteousness, as their salvation. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We are saved, we are saints, but the Latter-day Saints, my friend, are not saints. They do not believe that. And really, all they are is just a Latter-day Satan. Manifest himself. Because just as Satan said, I will be like the Most High, just as he said in the Garden of Eden, you will be as gods, just as he said, I will, in addition to God, be like God, that is what the Latter day Saints teach. That's right. That is the truth of their doctrine. That's what they will not tell you on the commercials that show them promoting family, family values. That is what they'll not tell you at the door, my friend, but that is the truth of what they believe. They believe that they will be gods. That's what they believe. I've heard other false teachers of our day preach this same doctrine besides just the Latter-day Saints. The Mormons, for those of you who don't live in Arizona, you know, or you haven't been here long enough to figure out what a Latter-day Saint is, because let me tell you something, we are right in one of their major hubs right here. Mesa, Arizona, 
is a major, major hub of, of the Mormon religion. I, I, went, I went soul winning in the Midwest. When I, when I was in Chicago, I went soul winning for years. I never even ran into a Mormon one time. Yeah. Never once. And I knocked thousands and thousands and thousands of doors. Never ran into one. You're dying in your head. What's that? They were kicked out. Yeah, they were thrown out of Illinois. That's why they went to, to uh, Missouri and later Salt Lake City and so forth. You guys, you guys knew how to handle it, man. <laughs> but anyway, the, the bottom line is, well, here we are, right next to a major hub of this false religion. But even besides the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, you know, there are other false teachers. I've heard a lot of charismatic leaders that have said, I, I heard Kenneth Copeland say that we are gods. Joyce Meyer said, we're gods. I, I, I heard the, the video clips of him saying that. We're gods. No, we're not. We're not gods. We are men. We are human beings, and we will never be gods. Amen. If you compare, there's a place in Psalms where he said, I've said you're gods. And people will try to quote that and say, see, you're God. But look, compare that with Ezekiel 28. He said, in the day that I slay you, Prince of Tyrus, and cast you down into hell, are you going to tell me then that you're a God in the day that you die like a man? And that's what he said in Psalms. Finish the rest of the quote. He said, I have said, ye are gods, but you shall die like men. It's not talking to believers. It's talking to unbelievers who think that they're gods because they know good and evil, that somehow that makes them a God. There is only one God. Who's got one of those imitate, those great imitations? I'm going to use that as part of my sermon outline. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm being, you know, Faith for War Baptist Church is really the greenest church in America. <laughs> think about it. Half the people in our church don't drive cars, number one. <laughs> number two, instead of reprinting part of my sermon, I'm just taking it right out of here without, you know, chopping down another tree to use this paper. The other reason why we're so green is because, you know, we're out soul winning so much, we're, we're walking. Oh, wait a minute. No, we're breathing out all that CO2. <laughs> I don't know. We're pretty green, though. Yeah, green. We hand out green. The songbooks are green. We do hand out green invitations. Go green. Go FWBC. Listen to this. This is what the former LDS, Latter-day Satan prophet, Brigham Young taught. This is what he said. How many gods are there? I do not know. But... There never was a time when there were not gods and worlds and when men were not passing through the same ordeals that we are passing through. So he said there are other gods and other worlds. Okay. Uh, the famous quote from the Mormon scriptures that says, you know, as, as God was, so is man, and as God is, so man shall be. That is a lie. God was never like we are. Amen. God is not a created being. He had no beginning. He said, I am the beginning. Amen. That's what Jesus Christ said. I am the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. He didn't have a beginning. Amen. He's from everlasting. Michael 5, 2. Listen to this scripture. Isaiah 43. We'll turn there. And while you're turning there, I'll read you 1 Timothy 2, 5, where it says, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There's one God. Right. Could it be any clearer? I like what it says in Mark 12. This is when Jesus is preaching, and he, he quotes the famous passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And when he quoted that, here's what the scribe answered him. He said, Well, Master, that was said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but He. Mark 12, 32. And Jesus answered him and said, He saw that He answered him discreetly, or correctly. He said, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You're in Isaiah 43, look at verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, Brigham Young. Right. Neither shall there be after me I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. We could go on and on, but all throughout Isaiah, if you want to do more reading on this, just read chapter 43, 44, and 45. And he says again and again, 
There's only one God. Beside me, there is no God. There's no one else. There's no, I may, you know, but no matter how many times you said it, again and again and again and again, they will still teach, oh, there's all these other gods. I knocked on the door of a Mormon. I was sold a couple weeks ago. And I was uh, giving him the gospel, and he basically was choking on the fact that it was believe only. You know, he's trying to say it works. You got to repent of your sins. You got to... You gotta follow the commandments, you gotta get baptized, you gotta go to church. He's saying all the work. And basically we get down to the end and I you know, and I basically said, I said, you know, I said, you're not saved, you know, you and plus you believe in multiple gods. You don't you don't believe there's one God. The Bible says one. He said, Who told you that? We only believe there's one God. No God. And I've had this conversation how many times? No. I said, No, I said, I know that you guys believe that there's more than one God. And I said, I've talked to Mormon missionaries, I've talked to, I said, I said, I've been doing this for 12 years door to door every week. I've talked to thousands of Mormons, I said, i got people in my extended family that are Mormons. I said, you guys believe that there's more than one God? I don't know who you've been talking to, but we only believe that there's one. You got your information all messed up. You know, you were, you were in my, my part. And, and then I, I basically pull out, I said, okay, well did Brigham Young say this? And I show him this quote from Brigham Young. And here's what he said. Well, what do you do with all the verses in the Bible that say God, that there's more than one God? And I said, wait a minute, just a minute ago you said that there wasn't more than one God. But see, they try to hide that. They don't want to get the reputation for being the pagans that they are. Right. They believe in multiple gods and they are pagans, my friend. They believe that they're always different gods. And they don't want that reputation because they, every Mormon you talk to, the first thing he'll try to Oh, yeah, you know, we're like you. <laughs> That's what they try to, it's like, oh, yeah, we're like you, you know. People try to say we're different or we're not Christian. No, we're like you. And they'll try to make it seem like they're just another denomination of Christianity. But my friend, there's a key tenet to Christianity that they're missing. That there is one God. And they will try to hide that but if you pin them down every single time, when you pin them down, they will say that there are other guys. Another time, going back about two months, same thing, I knock on a Mormon's door. He says, no, you're, you're all messed up. I don't know where you're getting this information. We only believe there's one God. You're confused. And this is how they justify it. They say, because usually you ask them, I always just ask them, how many gods are there? And they'll say, well, we only worship one. But see, that's how they're tricky about it. Well, we don't know. We only believe in one God. We only worship one God. And I always say, well, that's not what I asked you. I said, how many gods are there? And then sometimes they'll say something like, I have no more missionary say, you mean in all the universes? <laughs> and I'm like, I always thought that the universe started with uni because there's only who you knows. <laughs> so they say, oh, you mean all the galaxies are solar systems and kind of star systems? Yeah. And, and I'm like, yeah. And they said, well, we don't know. It could be any number of gods. But this guy a couple months ago, you know, same thing. I'm wrong. I don't know what I'm talking about. They only believe in one God, blah, blah, blah. So then I say to him, I say, well, let me ask you this. Has God always existed like our God? Has he always been around or was he created? Did he used to be a man like us? And he admitted that he used to be a man like us. And I said, okay, well, then when he was a man like us, didn't he have a God over him? And he said, yes. So first he tells me there's only one God. But then a minute later, he's telling me that our current God, you know, used to be a man on some other planet with some other God over him. And you're going to tell me that's Bible Christianity, that there are other planets with other gods, and that one day you will be like God, one day you can be as God and be a God of your own planet? That, my friend, is Satanic. That's right. That's right man. And, and, you know, you want, let's give a name to Satanism, Mormonism. Because, you know, it's not a bunch of people in dark hoods. Chanting. The Satan of the Bible is transformed into an angel of light, the Bible says. It says, no wonder. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light with his, his sanctuaries and his music and his tabernacle choir. And I'm not saying they're the only ones who are following Satan. We'll get to that later on. But let me tell you something. Satan in the Bible was the one who said, I want to be like God, and he tried to get human beings to do that same thing. Oh, you can be as God. 
And let me tell you, you're eating of the forbidden fruit, my friend. When you walk into that Mormon uh, temple, you're basically trying to achieve God's status when you get baptized into the Mormon religion and when you take of their sacraments, you're basically on the path to Godhood, according to them. But you're on the path to hell if that's where you're at. You need to be saved. You see, Mormonism is not Christianity. It's not Latter-day Saints. It's Latter-day Satan. Look at Galatians 1. Let's look at the origin of Mormonism. You say, are you an expert on Mormonism? I don't want to be an expert on Mormonism. They believe in multiple gods. Done. I remember my grandpa, he was a great soul winner. And my grandpa passed away when I was 11 years old, unfortunately. He's a great soul winner and a great man. My grandpa's family was all Mormons. He was raised a Mormon. He was raised like a Jack Mormon. You know, he wasn't really that into it. And his family wasn't really that into it. So he was raised as a Jack Mormon up in Idaho Falls, which is a really big Mormon area because it's just north of Salt Lake City, Utah. And he was raised there in a family, and he had 11 or 12 brothers and sisters, and he was raised up there. And when he turned 16, they told him, you know, too many mouths to feed, you know, go out and... Do something with your life. So he hopped on a freight train, came down to California, and uh, basically just, you know, made his own way in life. Well, he got saved. You know, he ended up meeting my grandma. They ended up getting married. He wasn't saved when they got married. She thought he was saved because he came down the aisle in a church service and was basically given a false gospel by the pastor who just basically told him that if he came to church and listened to the preaching, he was automatically saved and never baptized him or anything, and he didn't understand the gospel. And he said this, this is what he said. He said, I thought I was going to heaven because I, I looked at my wife's whole family, who were all Baptists, and I said, well, I'm every bit as good as they are. So if they're going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. So he thought it was works. You know, he didn't understand that it was just by believing on Christ. Later on, a five-year-old boy on the street witnessed to him and quoted a bunch of scripture to him. Did you hear me? A five-year-old boy witnessed to my grandpa. And he was so impressed by that, he ended up visiting the church that the five-year-old boy went to that he heard the gospel from. And then the pastor of that church came and won him to Christ a few days after they visited in the home and also won my dad to Christ when my dad was just a 10-year-old boy. So here's my grandpa, right? He got saved. His wife had already been saved. But the kids got saved. They started going to an independent fundamental Baptist church. Well, his desire was to win his relatives to Christ. That were all Jack Mormons up in uh, Idaho. And he would get together with them and try to give them the gospel, and they were just so hardened to it. Eventually, he got, uh, or I believe he got his mother saved, eventually. But he, he tried to give them the gospel, tried to give them the gospel. And finally, he said, you know what I'll do? I'm going to get a Book of Mormon. He said, I'm going to read this thing. Because I want to be able to intelligently talk to them, you know, and be able to, like, read it to disprove it, like, to use it again, you know, to show them that it's wrong. So he went out and he bought a Book of Mormon. He gets the Book of Mormon, gets to page two or something. He starts reading in it, like, one or two pages, and just started yelling, this piece of junk! <laughs> threw it at the wall, and it broke, and he threw it in the trash, and said, I'm not reading that garbage! You know, so he had kind of a bad temper. <laughs> <laughs> And then like a year went by, and then he decided he was going to do it again. Like, I'm going to read it, you know, same thing. Read a few pages, yelled at it, screamed, just cursed it, and threw it in the trash. <laughs> you know, I just skipped a step. I just didn't even start reading it. You know what I mean? He said, well, you need to read it. No, I don't want to fill my mind with something that I know is false. You say, well, how do you know it's false if you don't read it? Because anything that contradicts this book is false. That's right. Amen. And you know what? Otherwise, this book is false. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I know this book teaches that there's only one God. And I know that this book teaches that salvation is through nothing else but believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus paid it all. It's by faith alone. But where is Mormonism based? Are you in Galatians 1? Yeah. It's based upon a rev And I'm just simplifying for sake of time. I don't care to go into all the details of it. I'd rather preach the Word of God, you know. But it's based upon, basically, an angel came and spoke unto, you know, uh, Joseph Smith. You know, this guy Joseph Smith, an angel came and spoke unto him. Well, look what the Bible says in Galatians 1.6 about that. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you. Man, my voice is coming back. This is great. <laughs> I'm still going to preach for it. <laughs> I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you 
into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So he's saying, look, somebody's preaching some other gospel to you and you're falling for it? And he said, which is not another. What he's saying is it's not a completely different gospel. He's saying, but there will be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So he's saying it's not a completely new gospel. It's just a perversion of the existing gospel. It's like they took the gospel and twisted it. That's what perversion means. He said, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. He said, look, if you hear something different from some prophet or some dreamer of dreams, he said back in Deuteronomy, or some angel, even if it's an angel from heaven, Paul even said, though we, even if I come preaching some other gospel, even if you know it's me, even if you know it's an angel from heaven, he said, if they're preaching a different gospel, let it be accursed. Because you know this is true. Amen. So anything that violates this, you know it's not true. It doesn't matter who it's coming from. It doesn't matter if somebody does a miracle before you and does a sign. The devil does lying signs and wonders. Yeah, right. The Bible's clear on that fact. He said, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. I love the consistency. I was saying it then and I'm saying it now. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. And that's exactly what Mormonism is. Another testament of Jesus Christ. Another gospel. And you know what it is? It's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. It changes the gospel of Christ. And I'll say to you right now that Mormonism is a cult. You say, why is Mormonism a cult? Because Mormonism is following a man and not God and not the Word of God. And by the way, the Word of God is God. Read John 1.1. 1, 1. You see, they're following man. It started out by following Joseph Smith. And then they followed Brigham Young. And then they followed the next guy who's less famous, and therefore I don't know his name. <laughs> and then I followed, and then they, I didn't follow him, did that? And then they followed the next guy. And then they followed the next guy. And, then, and today, they are still following a man. And that man, listen to me now, that man, when he speaks, they will put more stock in what he says than in what the book says. And you say, well, why? No, that's not true. That, it is true, because they don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And I'll prove that to you. Here's what I've... Uh, you, you said you saw this etched in stone, didn't you, uh, Brother Garrett? They had this etched in stone outside the Mormon church up in... Uh, what's the name of the town? In Klamath Falls, Oregon. He saw it etched in stone at the, at the Mormon church there. And I've heard them say this verbally a million times, just in my soul winning. This is number eight of their 13 beliefs, or whatever, that they, that they promote. He said, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Now, hear me on this. What language was the Old Testament originally written in? What language was the New Testament originally written in? And what language was the Book of Mormon originally written in? English, right? Well, it was written in English. Yeah, it was written in America in the 1800s by Joseph Smith. So here's the deal. Theirs is always translated right. Because they've got the original. The Book of Mormon. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> but when it comes to the Bible, oh, it's filled with mistakes. Which is why, which is why, while Joseph Smith was on this earth, he spent time making his own Bible translation called the Joseph Smith Translation, often abbreviated the JST. And the Joseph Smith Translation was not based on him going back to the Greek or Hebrew. It was given him directly from God. Okay? And, and one of the five holy books of Mormonism is the Pearl of Great Price, which is just an excerpt from the Joseph Smith Translation of the Bible. Because you see, the Mormons don't even use the Joseph Smith Translation. They don't use it. They use what version? King James Version. But it's filled with mistakes. Because the Joseph Smith translation, even though it was straight from God, they don't use it. But he didn't finish it. 
they use the part of it they like, okay? But you see, the point is that if you really pin them down on something, they'll just tell you, well, you know what? That part's not translated correctly. How many of you have had a Mormon text? Yeah, you give them the guy, you show them it, well, that part's just not translated right. So here's my challenge to the, to the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Create a Bible translation that's right. I mean, if you're going to sit there and say over and over again for 150 years and more, it's not translated right, 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 right. you got millions and millions of dollars translated! Yeah, that's right. And then preach something that's right, but they don't want it to be right, because this isn't what they care about. It's what their prophet says and what the Book of Mormon says. That's what they believe in. Because if this book was an important thing to them, they wouldn't use a translation that they say is filled with errors. See how yeah, it doesn't make any sense? They got millions of dollars. They got a skyscraper up to up to heaven in, in Salt Lake City. They got, you know, they got all their TV ads. Maybe they could pull down a few TV ads for a while and a few of their YouTube ads and a few of their Google ads and maybe they could translate the Bible. But they won't. You can translate it any way you want. It's going to say that there's one God. It's going to say faith in Jesus Christ. Unless you just get some divine revelation that it's completely wrong and uh, I'm just going to make up my own version called the, the Joseph Smith translation. Now let me tell you something. It's a cult because this is not their authority at all. It's just what a man says. Now look, they say, well, oh, there's always been a prophet on the earth. Yeah, except that the prophets of the Bible never contradicted God's word. Do you ever see Jesus saying, oh, the Old Testament wasn't translated properly? <laughs> Show me one place where Jesus said, unfortunately, the rendering here is a little bit wrong in the, in the originals. Show me one place where Jesus contradicted. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill. He said, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all people. He didn't come and change the Old Testament. He didn't come and change what was already taught. He didn't come and contradict Moses and contradict the book of Psalms. He quoted Moses. He quoted the book of Psalms. And he fulfilled those things. Also, did you notice that the Old Testament prophesied of Jesus hundreds of times and thousands of times? So where does the Bible prophesy the book of Mormon? Where did God tell us, oh, by the way, I'm going to come and appear to the Indians? You know, hundreds of years from now and create a whole new thing. No, he said, the next time you see him, every eye shall see him. And he'll be coming in the clouds. That's the next time we're going to see him. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And he was, it wasn't saying come to the Indians. He said, come in the clouds where we can all see. The, the bottom line is that every prophet in the Bible was always consistent with the previous word of God that was revealed. Every prophet of the Old Testament was consistent with Moses and his preaching. Every prophet in the New Testament that was a true prophet of God, every book in the New Testament reinforces and strengthens what the Bible is already saying. But the Book of Mormon contradicts what the Bible is saying. And these other teachings, because by the way, Mormonism only got weirder after Joseph Smith died. You know, and I mean, a lot of the other really out there doctrines even came after he was gone because they've had a succession of these prophets that basically are constantly in contradiction of the scriptures. And so the way you can tell if it's a true prophet is, is everything they're saying lining up with this book. That's a true prophet. If somebody's contradicting everything in the Bible and preaching something completely different, and actually preaching what Satan preached in the Bible, well then that's a pretty good sign that that prophet is not of God. I don't care what wonder, and I don't even think Joseph Smith even did any wonders. What did he do? You know, part the river that separates Illinois from Missouri? I don't think he did any. What's that river called? Does anybody know? I don't think he did any. Let's see here. Mississippi. I don't know what he did. It might be the Mississippi. I don't know. It shows how much I know. About uh, geography, that is. But there's another religion out there that's so similar to Mormonism, and it's Islam. 
And really, Mormonism is just a white man's Islam. It's really all it is. It's Islam for white people. Joseph Smith is basically just a copycat of Muhammad. Because if you go back and look at Islam, what is Islam? A man went into the wilderness, revelation from an angel of God, and the Muslims will tell you the same thing as the Mormons when you knock their door. I knocked on the door of a Mormon, or I'm, I'm sorry, a Muslim in Tempe. And when I knocked on the door of this Muslim, he said, we believe Bible. We believe in Jesus. He said, I have to believe in Jesus to be a Muslim. We believe in the Bible because they believe in Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. And they believe they're all prophets. But he said this to me. He said, Jesus is not the Son of God. He never claimed to be the Son of God. I said, can I show you in the Bible where he claimed to be the Son of God? I opened the Bible and showed him. And he said, yeah, that part is not translated right. He said, that's also, he said, that part has been corrupted. He said, the Bible you're holding in your hand is nothing like the original Bible. He said, it's been changed and corrupted and lost in the translation. He said, the Bible never says this. And I said, can I show you where it says that? <laughs> no, that part's wrong. That's not really in the Bible. That Your Bible's wrong. And really, the Muslims claim to believe the Bible. Did you know that? Did you know that the Muslims claim to believe the Old Testament? And did you know that the Muslims claim to believe that Jesus was a true prophet? But that what we have today in our hands is not what they actually said. And that's exactly what Mormonism says. Mormonism says that basically the Bible is filled with mistakes, has been lost in translation and transmission, and it's not preserved. Both Joseph Smith and Mohammed... Both had a multitude of wives. Joseph Smith had multiple wives. Mohammed had five wives. <laughs> Joseph Smith was married to a 12, 13 year old girl. Mohammed was married to a nine year old girl. I was at Sony one time and said to a Muslim, Mohammed was married to an 11 year old, and they said, No, she was nine. And that's literally, <laughs> that's literally what I mean. They looked indignant, like, You're wrong! She was nine years old, and they gave me her name, and they told all about how he, you know, his wife that was his age died, and then he married this nine-year-old, and then he married four more wives. And I said, I thought your religion only allows you to have four wives. Why did Muhammad have five? And they said, well, you know, he was allowed to have five. Like that everybody else is allowed to have four. That's literally what they told me. And you see, Satan hasn't changed, has he? In the Garden of Eden, it was, you'll be as gods. You know, in, in Isaiah 14, he's trying to be God. In Ezekiel 28, he's trying to be God. In the 7th century, 8th century, 9th century, with Islam spreading throughout the world, it was multiple lives. It was an angel from heaven told us. It was the Bible has been corrupted. And it's the same thing today in 2010 in Mesa, Arizona. Be like God. And the only reason, my friend, that they don't have multiple wives today is because it's illegal in the United States. Because they had multiple wives in the early days of Mormonism. They had a multiplicity of wives until it was to the point where the federal government was literally going to go in there and, and, and do a Janet Reno on them. Okay? And basically everything and attack them with literal weapons when they finally said, okay, we'll stop, you know. And they issued their famous proclamation that they would not have polygamy ever again. And they had to phase it out because there were a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, who already had multiple wives. So they, they, they phased it out because of the fact that they were uh, being attacked by the federal government. That's why. That's what really happened. Colts. What's that? There was a new revelation. Yeah, they got, yeah, it was really convenient how this new revelation came that all of a sudden, you know, we're only supposed to have one wife now. <laughs> Even though just recently we were being told to marry all these young women. Okay? And, and look, Satan is the same. We're not ignorant of his devices. It's a wicked religion, my friend. You say, what are we going to do? How do we reach them? Just preach them the gospel. There's no trick to reaching them. And everybody always has a trick, I think, to reaching them. You know, well, when you find that trick, let me know. Because it seems like when I talk to these Mormons, you can show them anything out of the Bible and they don't care. Yeah. And I remember giving the gospel to a Mormon relative of mine for an hour and a half straight. 
just showing her verse after verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. After verse. And she said, you can show me anything you want. It will not change what I believe. She said, I know what I've felt. That's what she said. Now, I'm not saying it's hopeless, because I've met Mormons who were saved. I've met Mormons who've gotten saved. You know, and I've, and I've seen Mormons get saved, but you know what? It's tough to get Mormons saved. It's tough. It's going to take prayer and fasting. It's going to take work. It's going to take preaching. But we ought to recognize it for what it is, my friend, and not, not accept it as Christianity. And today you'll run into Christians who think that Mormons are saved. They're not saved. They don't believe in the God of the Bible. Amen. But the worst part is you'll see Baptists who begin to have the character traits of Mormonism. Yeah. Now listen to me. If I see a Baptist church or an independent Baptist having the traits of Mormonism, you know where I know that that came from? I know where Mormonism came from. Satan. I know that that, that that church is being influenced by Satan. And I can see that mentality. Here's the Baptist version. Oh, the translation isn't right on the King James. Right? How many times have you heard that in a Baptist church? Same thing. Yea, hath God said? I mean, is that really what God said? You know, trying to tell us, and, and, and not trying to tell us that there's some better version out there. Oh, no. Just none of them are right. They're all corrupt. You know, uh, it's the closest or the best we've got, but it's not always right. And then you pin them down on something and it's, oh, well, it's not translated right. When the Bible explicitly says something. You see other Baptists who just refuse to change what they believe when confronted with God's Word because of their own tradition, because of what they believe. That comes from Satan. Putting something else in authority above God's Word. You see the worship of man. You see the lifting up of a pastor or the lifting up of a leader among Baptists or any other religion. Whether it be the Catholics with the Pope or whether it be the Mormons with their prophet, where that man's words are more trusted than what the Holy Bible itself says. I can tell you where that came from. I can tell you where it came from when a man can stand up and preach and people will believe what he preaches more than what the Bible says. I sat, I sat in Bible college, my friend, and my teacher at Bible college, Chris Teft, stood up in class, in Bible doctor's class, he said this repeatedly, over and over, on the record, literally scores of times. Anybody who's been there can tell you that they probably heard this quote from Chris. He said, I have more confidence in Pastor Scott's doubt than I have in my own certainty. Did you hear me? And kids are literally right, or not kids, but, but uh, young people at college are literally writing that down as a quote that was a great quote. Let me say it again. I have more confidence in Dr. Scott's doubt than in my own certainty. Because he was quoting things where Dr. Scott said, I think, here's what I think this means in the Bible. Here's what I think it means. And he said, I'd rather go with what he thinks than what I know for sure. That's a cold my friend. Because you know what I know for sure? That the Bible's the Word of God. You know what I know for sure? That the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You know what I know for sure? That there's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You know what I know for sure? That I'm saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and nobody's doubt means anything to me. Amen. And that's a, that's a cult-like. It's of Satan. Are you hearing me? It is. It's cultic to sit there and point at a man and say, I have more confidence in his doubt than in my own certainty. You are not teaching these pastors what needs to be taught, which is that God's word is the only thing we're certain of. It's the only thing that we should have confidence in. Amen. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. Psalm 118.8. And so we need to watch out. You say, oh, I don't feel like this sermon applies to me because I'm not a Mormon. I've never been a Mormon. I'm never going to be a Mormon. I don't live in Mesa. <laughs> I don't want to go soul winning in Mesa. Hey, I don't blame you because I don't want to go soul winning in Mesa either. <laughs> but there's that big map 
out there. And there's that big spot that's made for the Gregory and I have been going solo in the Mesa. <laughs> he and I are going where others don't want to go. And Brother Gregory and I are also one of you may say, I don't want to go either. But you know, we've got to. We've got to preach the gospel to every creature. And I'll tell you something. This sermon ought to apply to us because you, you say, well, none of these things apply because I, you know, I'm not more, I don't know anymore. Here's the thing, though. We know where these things came from. They came from Satan. Watch out for these things creeping into your life or into your church. Watch out for pride. Watch out for the I will be like God attitude. Watch out for lifting up a man as a prophet. Nothing wrong with being a prophet, but you know what? You better preach what the Bible says like every biblical prophet did and not contradict this book. Because anything you say as a prophet that contradicts this book right here is not from God. Because God is not the author of confusion. It should all be consistent. Watch out for the spirit of Mormonism, the spirit of latter-day Satan, wherever it may crop up its, its ugly head. Let's fire it and have a word of prayer. Father, please just uh, bless this sermon to our ears. Help us to never lift ourselves up and think of ourselves above what we ought to think. Help us to remember we're just men. We're just human beings. We're not God. We never will be God. And God was never like us. Father, please just help us to be able to reach the, the Mormons, dear God, because they're, they're a tough crowd, let me tell you. You can show them and preach it to them, but it's, it's going to have to be your spirit, dear God, that's going to that's gonna do this. And so I pray that as we begin to knock a lot of doors in Mesa, as we finish out Tempe and, and really begin to do a lot more doors in Mesa, as we go in all four directions from our church, dear God, I just pray that you would please... So go before us and soften the hearts. God, please, we love these people. Soften the hearts and help them to see the light of the glorious gospel shining through your word as it's preached. Give us boldness, dear God. Give us wisdom. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit as we go and bring the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.